Good morning. You're about to listen to a sermon that I think needs a bit of an introduction. As, as things start to get kind of back to normal as it relates to COVID and numbers start to look a little better and, and thankfully here in the valley, numbers are starting to look a little better. And as people are now returning to worship, uh, today's sermon is born out of a prayerful conviction that, that God is going to do something new here at River Church. God is going to use us as a church in this new day, in this new era in our community. And, and, and so as you have maybe had a, a boring or rather uneventful, maybe even a fearful year, and maybe now you're thinking about returning to some sense of normalcy, returning to public worship, I, I ask that you would listen uh, listen to today's message with a sense of expectancy. What might God want to do in my life in the coming, in the fall of 2021 and, 20, and, and the year 2022? What might God be calling us as a church to? Might God be on the edge, on, uh, just, just about to bring revival to us as a church and to our community in this new era? I hope you listen. I I hope it's a meaningful message. Uh, it speaks deeply into your heart. Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Uh, today's sermon is entitled, A New Day is Dawning. Because I believe that God wants to do something new in your life individually. And I, I believe God's about to do something new in the life of our church. Uh, a new day is dawning. I believe that God wants to take your apathy, the boredom that you've experienced over the last year, and he wants to take your preoccupation with self. And he wants to exchange it for, for something else in this great exchange that we've been talking about over the last five months now. He wants to exchange your apathy, your, your preoccupation with self for a deep love for your community. And an exciting new dream that I believe God is going to give you for your life and, and for the life of the church you see, if my God is too small, then my life becomes too safe. And when my life becomes just too safe, then my aversion to risk, it just starts to bore me to death. That's no way to live. What if on the heels of this pandemic that we've all been experiencing together, what if God wants to use River Church in this new day uh, for some great revival work in this city. Are you ready for that? Are we, as a church, ready for that? We talked about it last week, that God is in the business of making all things new, taking what's broken and putting it back together and making it new again. Will you join him in that plan of making all things new? That's what we're talking about today. Today, I want to give hope to those of you who are dreamers. Or maybe you're daring to dream of, of, of a great change, a new direction in your life. All of you dreamers, all of you visionaries, I, I want to see you drill down deep, become a, a more effective a part of, of who we are as a church. All of you who are considering taking a risk. I believe God is pleased with that. I don't think God is bothered at all by the fact that we expect too much out of life. In fact, I think God is bothered by the fact that we expect too little out of life. Satisfied with just the hum, drum, safety of the boring life that we've experienced for decades in some cases, uh, for the last year in many cases. That sort of small living, I don't think that's what God intends for us. Uh, the Peter, the great evangelist, St. Peter, in his first sermon in the book of Acts, he said, he said that when the Holy Spirit comes upon Christians, uh, that, that, that we will be overcome to, to the point that we will become dreamers, visionaries. How long has it been since you've dreamed a dream? Had a vision. 
The Apostle Paul, we see it in Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, he used to preach to, to, to the audiences that, that, that God is able to do far more abundantly than you can ask, far more abundantly than you can even imagine. So I ask, is your faith radical, extreme? Is your faith visionary? COVID is winding down and things are going to be back to normal soon. And so I ask, who do you want to be as a church? Who do we want to be as a church? Today we're looking at the story of, of a man in the Old Testament named Nehemiah. He had a safe job and he had a safe life. And God took from him that safety net and he exchanged it for a deep love for the city of Jerusalem. And that took planning, it took prep work, and it, it took risk and, and money and a bigger dream than Nehemiah had ever dreamt in his entire life to that point. What if today God is going to give us a great big dream for who we might be as a church in 2021, in 2022? What if we look back on today as something, as a day in which God, he began a new work. Post-COVID, he began a new, he, he gave us a new dream for this city. Now, we're going to look at, we're going to look at the story of Nehemiah and see how the gospel might be, the good news of Jesus might be found in this story, it might be applied to our lives as a church so I need to summarize the whole story. We can't read the entire book of, of Nehemiah today, but here's the summary. Jerusalem is the city on display in this story. Uh, Jerusalem is the city meant to declare God's holy name. Um, but at, at the point of this story, it lies in ruin. The city is just, it's a wreck. The year is 455 B.C., and, and the glory days of King David and King Solomon are, are now history, and the city is a deserted ghost town, and all of its inhabitants have been hauled away. Uh, they're now slaves, uh, imprisoned uh, to the empire of Persia. So they're in a foreign land. Everyone except for the, the poorest, the, the lowliest of people had been left in Jerusalem, but everyone else had been carried off into captivity. And now uh, Nehemiah, uh, living in Persia, he's a normal dude. He's, he's an overachiever, but he's, he's normal. He's not a pastor. He's not rich. He's not famous. He's just normal. And he's the central character in this story, the central human character. So, so we have Jerusalem as the central city, and we have Nehemiah living in exile in Persia, a long ways away as the central character. And, and I, I'm going to give you an entire summary of the story today, and then, then we'll pick it apart a little bit. At first, um, God just seems to, to cause Nehemiah to prosper. Um, Nehemiah, he, he rose, he, of course, he's, he's, a, he's a foreigner. He's living in a foreign land. He's a, He's a slave, he's a prisoner of war. And so he, he rises through the ranks of King Artaxerxes' court there in Persia. He, he rises the rank to, to this prestigious and, and highly trusted position. He was called the king's cupbearer. So he worked in the royal court, even though he is in, he's, he's from the nation of Israel. Uh, and this provided him close proximity uh, to uh, and, and high credibility with the king of Persia. And this in turn causes the king to notice Nehemiah's sadness. He was sad over, over the, the, the state, the lost state of Jerusalem, the, 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 the city of Jerusalem. It, it, it lay in ruin. And it was far away, and there's nothing that that Nehemiah can do about it, but he wants to do something about it. But he's in this foreign land in the kingdom of Persia. And, and so, so because he is the cupbearer to the king, the, the king notices that there's something wrong with Nehemiah. And so, 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 so Nehemiah, the, the king, he, he, he gives him an opportunity to, to go. 
you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to do something about this dream you have. You need to, 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 to fix what's broken in your city. So soon Nehemiah is off to Jerusalem with, with the royal leave of absence and a building permit and a military escort. And when he arrived, he quickly, he mobilizes all the volunteers to rebuild the section of the city's crumbled wall. He starts by building the wall. And, and these folks, uh, they, they had a mind to work. And things are going well. And then he's got these enemies, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. They enter the picture uh, and, and their people remembered Judah's former regional dominance. And they don't want uh, Jerusalem to be, uh, Judah to be dominant anymore. Uh, so, so a rebuilt Jerusalem meant that uh, a Jewish resurrection uh, would, would, would mean dominance again of the nation of, of Israel. And so Sanballat and Tobiah, they're, they're determined to keep that from happening. So they try everything. Uh, when it comes to Nehemiah, who's this guy that shows up to, to win the day, uh, they, they, they jeered and insulted and they threatened attack and they plotted assassinations and they intimidated the Jewish families. They even threatened to tell the king Artaxerxes back in Persia that, that his cupbearer uh, had treasonous plans to appoint himself king of Judah. But none of this worked because Nehemiah 2.8 says that the good hand of God remained on Nehemiah and his crew. However, the, these, these bad dudes, Sanballat and Tobiah, their work, uh, they, they did, however, slow the progress. Half of the crew stopped building in order to stand guard, and the other hand, the other half worked while carrying. It said like they had a, a trowel in one hand and a, a sword in the other hand. Uh, even at night, they remained battle ready. They would they would sleep with their battle garb on, uh, and it was a costly distraction. It slowed the work, but it didn't deter Nehemiah. He continued on. Productivity would have uh, have more than doubled with focused, rested workers, but, but they, they dealt with what they had, and, 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 and God gave Nehemiah favor with, with mighty uh, King Artaxerxes uh, back in Persia, uh, and, and, uh, and so he was able to, to deal with Sambalat and deal with Tobiah, deal with his enemies. And, 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 you know, in our case, when we have distractions like that, we allow wasted time, Wasted energy, wasted money. But, but, but uh, Nehemiah, he didn't. In God's economy, none of those resources were wasted. He invested them in the building, uh, building something far more important and precious than a wall around Jerusalem. He was actually building faith. He was actually building the faith of his people. Now, with that as a backdrop, let's just back up a little bit and let's read the words of Nehemiah. It goes like this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Okay, you may have noticed, I've now, I've now gone back to the beginning of the story where Nehemiah is just hearing word of just the terrible state of, of Jerusalem. Going on, it says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, oh, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his covenants. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statues, and the rules. 
that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you've commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are faith, unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though, you're out, though you are outcasts, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power, by your strong hand. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And then he closes with, now I was cupbearer to the king. Okay, so that's the prayer that he prays. And then he goes in, asks for permission to, uh, to build the wall. The king sends him and then the story that I just told you ensues. So today I have four big ideas that I think we can glean from this, from this story. Big idea number one, God loves the 956. That's our area code in case you don't know. God loves the valley. God loves Cameron County. And God loves the city of Brownsville. What may seem as though it's broke down, it may seem as though you know, it's seen its better days, it may seem as though there's a lot to be fixed, because there is. But, but God loves the 956, and in fact, he loves the 956 exponentially more than any of us. God loves the city because the city is filled with people. And God loves people. In fact, the church is, is this, this small microcosm, a small city within a larger city, meant to love and to serve the city and to, to care for the RGV. In fact, it's a scary position to not care about what God cares about. I mean, if God cares about people and therefore God cares about our community, for us to not care about our community, that's a scary proposition. You see, Nehemiah's incredible work began with a love for his city and a love for his people. And it's easy to love people as a group. But it's hard to love them one at a time, isn't it? And yet that's what we're called to do, to love people one at a time. People ask me all the time about my love for the city of Brownsville. I mean, I grew up here, went to high school here, I left, but I came back. People ask me, why did you come back to Brownsville? Why did you come back to the valley? And it's, it's hard to explain, except that it was just, I believe, a God-given love for the 956. I mean, I didn't have to come back. I was doing fine living in a different state, but Lydia and I, we came home. People used to ask me when I would go do the uh, jalapeno eating contest at the Sombrero Festival, why do you, do, do you like jalapenos? <laughs> I'd say, no, but I just love the people. And I love uh, the people that I call neighbors. And I, uh, here on the border, I just want to love them more because God loves the people here on the border. I ask you, do you love the people here on the border? Do you spend time with people here on the border? Do you spend time with your neighbors? The opposite of love, well, maybe some would say it's hate. I would say it's selfishness. People who, who, who live isolated, all alone, never engage anyone around them, that's selfish, self-absorbed. Isolation is clear evidence to me that, that, that one does not love people the way Jesus loved people, the way Nehemiah loved people. Someone recently gave me a, a mug. Um, it's an insulated mug, and it's got the, 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 uh, the map uh, of, like a, of, of Brownsville, of, of Brownsville. And I, I just love using that cup because it reminds me that I love the RGV. I love Cameron County. I love Brownsville. I, I love Charo Days, and I love the Sombrero Festival specifically. I love Dean Porter Park and Gladys Porter Zoo and 
I love Oliveira Park where I learned to swim and I love the Los Fresnos Rodeo and the Mercedes Livestock Show. And I, I love the valley. If you don't love the city, then you're not going to be very invested actually in River Church. Because we as a church, we're called to love the city. If your boots are pointed north, uh, you're, you're, you're always thinking about moving out of this place, then your heart is not aligned with the heart of God. I mean, yeah, God may move you one day, but, but right now you're here. And, and God loves the city, and he calls us as a church to love the city. Moving or staying, coming or going, your isolation, your, your, your isolated lifestyle, which is a choice, by the way, your, your isolated sort of lifestyle, it's going to render you as a Christian largely fruitless. You'll live safe. Uh, you'll always be pumping the brakes. You'll never take a risk. I, I call us to, to be risk takers, to, to love the city. As I said, I believe that a new day is dawning, that God has something that he's going to do with us in this post-COVID era here in the valley. My job as a pastor, it can at times give me permission to be like all alone, solitary confinement, studying God's word, writing sermons. But I work to, to be around guys and be out in the community. And, and my, my wife, Lydia, she works to be invested in ladies and out in the community. I don't know what you do for a living. I mean, actually, I do. And I know what most of you do. But, but you know, maybe you're a pharmacist. Maybe you're a, a shoemaker. Not really. But maybe you're a, a farmer or stay-at-home housewife. If you work any job that keeps you isolated, then I encourage you. Work to break out of that isolation. Work to engage the community. I know we've been isolating. Uh, I, I get that. But now it's time to, to move out of that. To, 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 to engage the community. Big idea number one, God loves the 956. And, and if our heart is going to be parallel with God's heart, then, then we're going to follow in his footsteps and we're going to love this place as well. Big idea number two, the great movement in the RGV, it's going to begin with prayer. I mean, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some money. It's going to take some time and effort, but it's going to begin with prayer. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher and theologian, said this of revival. We can define revival. We can define it as a period of unusual blessing and activity in the life of the Christian church. Revival means awakening, stimulating the life, bringing it to the surface again. Amen. It's kind of like being, being awakened, like we've been asleep spiritually as Christians. Like we're, we're, we're sleeping, we're slumbering, all alone, but then the Holy Spirit moves and we're awakened. We're, we're enlivened. There's this unusual sort of activity and blessing, and awakening, and, and, and the stimulating of life, as, as Martin Lloyd-Jones Lloyd says. Should we pray for revival? Absolutely. Should we begin by praying for revival? Absolutely. Another great pastor theologian um, by the name of Tozer said this, it's, it's a, a revival. Have you, have you noticed how, many, how much praying for revival has been going on of late and how little revival has resulted? Well, that's kind of a bummer, right? He says this, I believe the problem is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying, and it simply will not work. I would say that those two things go hand in hand. We pray and we make sure that our lives are lives of obedience to the Father. I mean, if we're if we're out sinning and disobeying and doing our own thing and then praying for revival, 
That will be ineffective, won't it? So Lloyd-Jones and Tozer call us to a position of prayer, and expectancy, and obedience. The, the, the history of revival, I don't know if you know anything about the history of revival, but two characteristics of revival historically. One has been prayer, and the other has been a movement among young adults in the community. I don't know if you've noticed, I mean, if you're isolated, you haven't, but I don't know if you've noticed, but, but God has been bringing new faces, new young adults to River Church, and I'm excited about that. And, and, and I would say that, that that is a mark of the potential that God could bring revival to our church, and revival to our community. My heart is for the university because I believe that, that revival will begin with young adults. Will you be a part of that? I've been praying for this. I've been praying for today. Uh, I'm going to preach this sermon just a little bit on Sunday morning right here in the room with everyone that attends worship physically. And I've been praying for it. I've been praying that, that today would, God would, would begin something really big for us as a church. As we read Nehemiah's prayer for his city, did you notice what his prayer consisted of? His burden. His burden was over what was broken in the city. Are you, are you burdened by what is broken in our city? Are you troubled by what God is troubled by? Let me let me return to a theme that I that I that I was on uh, a direction that I was on just a moment. What if the things that you care most about are the things that God cares most about? In contrast to that, caution. What if the things that you care most about aren't the things that God cares most about? What are the things that God is most concerned about? Or things that don't really even cross your mind. Going on. Big idea number three. Great spiritual revivals are messy. They always have been. I mean, historically, two great revivalists, John Wesley and, and, and Whitfield, they both struggled mightily with the idea of preaching out in the farm fields. They were proper Oxford men, well-trained theologians after all, but but their use of such profane methods as preaching out of doors, it helped to spur the great revival of their day. Now, for us as a church, if we want to see God move in our church and move in our community through River Church, it may be a little messy. It was messy for Nehemiah in, in today's story. Now, you may have to, to go to a festival like the Sombrero Festival. You may have to knock on somebody's door and invite them to church. You may be a little uncomfortable. You may have to get out of your comfort zone and do something that is a bit messy. I mean, we learn from today's story, the story of Nehemiah, that distractions, they're not a hindrance to ministry. In fact, sometimes they are the ministry. I mean, you think about Nehemiah's men working out there building the walls and women working out there building the walls and they had a trowel in one hand, building the wall and a, a sword in the other hand. It seems like a distraction. Like, why does it have to be this way? But, but, but actually, maybe there was a greater purpose. Sometimes our distractions, they're not a hindrance to ministry. It's actually the actual ministry that's going on at that moment in time. A beautiful truth about ministry comes out of today's text is that, that it's messy. It's difficult. A, a great lesson from today's story is that distractions in ministry are not a hindrance to ministry. Rather, sometimes they are the ministry. Remember, Nehemiah had his men and women, they were working they were building the wall with a trowel, working the wall on one hand and a sword on the other because of all the opposition they had to fight. Don't you know they were just like, why does it have to be this way? Why the distraction? We could get so much more done if we didn't have to have these distractions. But, but, but in reality, 
Nehemiah, he, 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 if he didn't want distractions, he never had to leave Persia in the first place. I mean, he was, he was doing well, experiencing success. He'd risen to the cupbearer to the king, highest level of security clearance as a foreigner, direct access to the king. As Nehemiah set out in, the, in, in this story to rebuild the city, building permit in hand, uh, what he does not yet know is the fact that, that he will meet great, great distractions, insults, opposition at every corner, and God will purposely use every one of them, every one of those hardships, for good. In our lives, our biggest distractions, in ministry, in, in caring for the city, our biggest challenges, distractions, they actually will be the ministry. They will provide for us the ministry opportunities if we'll slow down and humble ourselves and trust that the Lord is in this. Even the hard parts. Big idea number four. Revival in the RGV begins in my own heart. It, it's not going to happen in the church until it happens in my heart. It's not going to happen in your church, same church as my church, until it happens in your heart. And it's going to spread to, to my friend, my family, my neighbor. And then it's going to spread outside of the walls of this church. But it's going to begin, if it's going to begin, it's going to begin in my own heart. I need a fresh wind. I need a fresh fire. I, Nehemiah begins this whole story, if you remember, by reviewing his sin, the sins of his family, the sins of his nation, his own need for God's forgiveness, his own need for God's healing, his own need for God's renewal. And if God's going to move in our community and our church, it's going to begin by me admitting my own sickness, my own brokenness, my own need for God's healing. In that great exchange, the gospel story, Jesus, he takes my sin and, and brokenness and he gives me his righteousness. If revival is going to happen in the 956, it's going to, it's, it's going to begin with me admitting my own brokenness, my own need for the gospel power in my own heart. The beginning of the healing of an entire nation begins with Nehemiah's deeply repentant prayers. The broken heart of one single individual man. What if he had never personally been broken? What if he had never personally had this contrite spirit? You know, just, just, just breaking down emotionally in the quietness of his own home. If that never would have happened, this story never would have happened. And he would, he would have just died a bored man, the cupbearer to the king, and Jerusalem's walls would have never been built, at least not through Nehemiah. There's another man in history who looked on the city of Jerusalem with, with, with deep sadness. It happened 500 years after the story of Nehemiah. Another person who weeps over the brokenness of Jerusalem. His name is Jesus. And, and he's weeping over, over the sin, the brokenness of the city. He's weeping and, and broken over the, the sin of Brownsville as well. Matthew 23, verse 37. He, he cries out for, for Jerusalem I believe he cries out for Brownsville in the same, with the same passion. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often, Jesus said, how often would I have gathered you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood un under her wings and you were not willing. It's, it's a beautiful picture of, of Jesus' heart for the city. Dream with me, would you? What if, what if God wants to bring revival to the RGV, to the Rio Grande Valley? What if he wants to begin with River Church? Oh, that it might be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end by just putting these three, these three thoughts on the screen now. And would you consider them? Maybe this is your heart. Maybe this is a commitment that you would like to make today. Number one, I want to break out of isolation. 
I've been all by myself for the last year. I want to I want to break out of that. I've been all by myself maybe for my entire life. I want to, I want to, I want to live in community. I want to start doing things with people at River Church and be invested in the ministry of River Church and see what God might have for me. Number two, I want to be a light in my neighborhood. I just spent some time this morning driving around Brownsville and thinking about the old part of the city and the new part of the city and, you know, my old stomping grounds. And maybe just, I, I want to, I want to be a light in my neighborhood. I want, to, I want to invite some people to church. I want to invest in some people's lives. I want to get to know my neighbors. And Third choice, third, 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 third commitment. I, I hope you'd make all three. It was like this. I want River Church to have an amazing impact on the RGV. Going forward, post-COVID, going forward into the fall of, of 2021, going forward into the year 2022, Let's, let's pray that, that River Church might have an amazing impact on the RGV. Oh, that's my prayer. That's my heart. May it be our heart. Amen.